Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Nikwe Onwanyi, and I am the president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. Today, March 30th, is National Doctors' Day. So I do like to take the moment to recognize the physicians attending today's program, as well as those around the world for their service, dedication, and the compassionate care they bring to their patients and the communities in which we all serve. I also want to share a special thank you to our ABC member physicians who are leading the way on important issues every day, including the one that brings us here today. Thank you all for taking the time to attend this special screening of the docufilm, Death in Justice, and a roundtable discussion led by our cardiovascular disease in women and children committee co-chairs about the black maternal health crisis in the United States. ABC was founded in 1974 because no one was addressing the specific health needs of black people. So 70 men and one woman, all physicians or scientists focused on cardiovascular disease, got together and decided to do something about this. It was the firm belief that black people should have access to health care and be provided with the same level of technology and information as everyone else. These efforts and the ABC mission to promote the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease, including stroke in blacks and other minorities, as well as to achieve health equity for all through the elimination of disparities continues today. The topic of tonight's screening and discussion is particularly important for the ABC and its members. Given that maternal health is intimately tied to cardiovascular health, our ABC members are uniquely positioned to help address the black maternal health crisis. We are the intersection of being either patients, relatives of patients, healthcare professionals, and advocates, or all of the aforementioned. With the recent Wall Street Journal CDC report on the significant increase in maternal mortality in the United States, there remains a palpable urgency to eliminate the maternal health disparities and poor cardiovascular outcomes that impacts our community. ABC was founded almost 50 years ago on the principle of being a voice for our communities while working to improve the lives of diverse populations. It's for this reason that we launched the We Are in the Faces of Black Maternal Health campaign which you will learn more about tonight. And now I do like to introduce Dr. Annette Anson, a pediatric cardiologist and a co-chair for the ABC's Cardiovascular Disease in Women and Children Committee. Thank you, Dr. Anwanye. Good evening, everyone. The mission of our committee, the Women and Children's Committee, is to improve the cardiovascular health of children and women across the lifespan. This committee also serves as a resource for the ABC by identifying ways to encourage and maintain the active participation and advancement of women in the association, as well as the cardio cardiology profession. This is achieved through educational programs, research and awareness initiatives, and networking. We strongly believe that addressing cardiovascular disease across the lifespan of women and children is key to making a difference in our communities. After all, as it pertains to today's discussion, Black women are first Black girls. And with that, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Rachel Bond, who is an adult cardiologist and my co-chair for the Women and Children's Committee. Thank you, Dr. Ansong, and thank you, Dr. Anwanye, for that wonderful introduction as well. Tonight is about Black mothers. 
as well as mothers to be, because every woman deserves a beautiful birth story. And I want to repeat that poignant tagline by Birthing Justice that every woman deserves a beautiful birth story. We know that this powerful tagline of Birthing Justice, is a, which is a feature length documentary film that captures the experiences and challenges of Black women, their families, caretakers, and advocates, as well as examines the structures and systems that determine disparate rates of mortality. And as Dr. Anwanye noted, this could not come at a more opportunistic time as we've heard the stats. Some of us actually intimately know these stats. And despite this, as recently as what we saw in the uh, data from the CDC, we currently are seeing the highest rates in nearly six decades of maternal mortality with stark racial divide as maternal and infant mortality rates as well as maternal morbidity rates are climbing. And we know that uh, tip of the iceberg is really the fact that for every mother that dies, nearly 75 to 100 nearly die. And when we think about birthing justice, it gives a face and a voice to these near misses to allow a chance for these Black women, their caretakers, as well as their advocates to be seen, heard, and most importantly, be respected. As the late Malcolm X said, the most disrespected person in America is a Black woman. The most unprotected person in America is a Black woman the most neglected person in America is the black woman. And we must listen to black women for they will tell us what is needed to really shift the narrative and achieve true birthing justice. And with that, here is our feature docufilm. Yeah, something, something's happening, but I don't know what's happening. And I just said, you know, I'm thinking, I just want this to be over with. Just do what you have to do so I can just be with Sloan. And then I heard her say, book an OR and call for blood. I held Matt's hand and I squeezed his hand and I said, I don't want to die. And I don't know if I said it quietly. I don't know if I was screaming, but I just held his hand so tight and I was holding Sloan and I said, please don't let me die. I'm just laying there, and it's almost like watching a movie happen. Like, you hear these stories about black women. And this beautiful black sister came in there. She said, sis, what's going on? What's happening? I said, I think I'm dying. My head is about to explode, and I think my pressure just shot up. She puts the blood pressure cuff on. I felt lightheaded. The room was spinning. And in that moment, I really thought that I was going to die. I didn't want to be in a situation where I had to mitigate some sort of racist or prejudice experience. I didn't want to be in a situation where I would have to come in defense mode. I wanted to go into birth with peace. Hey there, can I speak to Kayla? Hey darling, I was noticing my patient was having some variables. What is her Pitocin at? Let's pause that for right now, especially with those variables. The patient that I sent over, she is very tacky. Have they started an IV on her yet? Tell them while we're waiting for that CMP, if I can get a blood sugar on her to see if maybe that's what's causing this because I also found that last time she had something to eat or drink because if this doesn't resolve, she's going to be staying with us. Thank you so much. Okay, all right, bye-bye. I mean, the biggest misconception is, is there something that we are doing? There is something inherently wrong with our body, our makeup, our genes. 
Um, there's something that we're eating. There's some ways that we are behaving that somehow these bad habits have put us in a situation for poor maternal health outcomes. And there's nothing that we are doing that is so different than anyone else in this country. The perfect storm is Black women who are dying during pregnancy because of underdiagnosed conditions, Black women who are dying during childbirth because they are ignored when their concerns are heard, Black women dying in the postpartum period because they do not have ready access to physicians when they experience postpartum complications. Baby actually moves with you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're moving in there with you, okay? <laughs> it's not something that we're doing that's any different from anyone else. So I really prefer to just say, hey, call it what it is, it's racism. Racism is killing us. Right? Your heart can't take it. So we literally die from broken hearts. They're just doing like a rotation and yeah. they're just like trying to find a lock and key, trying to get out of this way, like, you know. White people say that all the time, that they don't see race. I've never, ever heard a person of color say that in all the years that I've been alive. And so it's obvious. It's something that is 100% weighing on the minds of the families and the community that I serve. And so not acknowledging it is, it does harm because it's almost like gaslighting an issue that is not okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was a state senator in a southern state who said, you know, maternal mortality isn't so bad if we don't count black women. Louisiana, about a third of our population is African-American. African-Americans have a higher incidence of maternal mortality. Uh, so if you correct our population for race, um, we're not as much of an outlier as it would otherwise appear. If that was not an illustration of implicit bias, I don't know whatever could be. The idea that there is a single metric that you can use to determine the health of a society, which is the infant mortality rate. And we have long had a significant disparity in this country for black babies dying. We've had that happen in my family, my extended family. And it was something that as a nursing student, I was really compelled to work on. And she had called the doctor about her headache mm -hmm. and about the swelling. And the doctor told her that it would go down in a couple of days. Wow. And I told her, I said, no, you're not waiting a couple of days. Yeah. You know, you're gonna go to the emergency room today. To have the doula. There's something deeply wrong when in 2022, we can't keep our moms alive, uh, deeply. And this is not a unique phenomenon. I want to be very clear about this. It's not a unique phenomenon for Black birthing people, but our rates are the worst. When you went to the emergency room, did they do a urinalysis at all? So she did. I left it, but I don't think they even tested it. There's two things at play there. It's not only the racism that exists in a clinical setting between provider and patient, but there's the accumulated biological effects of the lived experience of racism that is also impacting us. <laughs> My experience with the previous physician that I was dealing with before, forcing me to take medications, knowing that it is I'm a holistic mom. You're wearing like an undershirt just so the Velcro doesn't like spray. I have a 29-year-old daughter. Many of her friends are afraid to become pregnant. So I just want to be clear, we can make people afraid. I have a seat okay. and we'll take a look at your incision. There are black women who are normal weight, who have college education, and who have same wealth as white women are still more likely to die within a year of childbirth than their white counterparts. So we cannot buy or educate our way out. We can't exercise our way out. The data shows that even when we do all of those things, we're still more likely to die. Thank you.
Sports has really just given me a life that I never could have imagined. I think it really taught me how to overcome a lot of adversity. You know, you're always dealing with some type of hiccup or something and you have to overcome it. And I think it prepared me in a sense for motherhood. It's prepared me to be a fighter. My husband was so excited. We had wanted to be parents, you know, I've always wanted to be a mom. Professionally, it was difficult because in my sport, there had just been a culture of silence regarding pregnancy and starting families. And a lot of women had not been supported through starting a family. And so I had always felt like I had to do everything first before I could even think of starting a family. And I hated that I felt that way. And so it became true for me as well. You know, I had a really difficult time at the time I was with um, Nike and letting them know that I was pregnant and seeing if they would support me through that. And so I was asking that they not reduce my pay in the months following childbirth so that I would have time to regain top form. And they said that they were willing to give me time, but basically they were not ready to set that precedent for all female athletes. And that became a, an issue that I was not okay with. I ended up parting ways because of that. I had a really great pregnancy. I felt good, I was exercising, I was running, I was in the pool, I felt really strong. And at 32 weeks, I was going to the doctor for just a regular routine appointment. And at that point, um, found out that I was spilling protein and I was immediately sent over for further monitoring to the, to the hospital. And once I got there, things were kind of spiraling down. I was diagnosed with a severe case of preeclampsia. And it just became really scary because that was not in my plan at all. They made the decision to, to have an emergency C-section delivery for my daughter, and it was scary. I was terrified, but really grateful that we were able to come out on the other side of that. It wasn't what I had planned or expected at all or imagined, but at that moment, you know, the most important thing was seeing my daughter fight and seeing her regain her health. We made it, and that's something that, unfortunately, a lot of women, you know, don't experience. This is not our burden to carry. This is a society that has allowed this to happen. We have allowed our moms to die for generations. We are very clear on the problem that we're trying to solve. We are trying to end this maternal mortality crisis. And what we are doing now is we're saying that's unacceptable and we will not allow that to continue.
Have you ever seen somebody have a vaginal birth? Mm -mm. No. I would encourage you to YouTube it, Instagram. Just no, I've YouTube. seen that. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, okay. Not, okay. Not in real life. Oh, not in real life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just because I was telling her, like, just to be prepared on what she's going to look like when she's in labor. And, mm -hmm. like, she might throw up. There might be a little bit of poop. Mm -hmm. She'll be moving. She may not make great eye contact. But, like, all of those things are normal, and I don't want you to be stressed out. I'm not going to be stressed out. You're not? Mm -hmm. You do give me a vibe that you're real chill. Try to be. Okay, I'm with it. I'm with it. <laughs> My whole approach, especially working with like new moms, is really shaped off of my own experiences. I came from a background that was under resourced, I'll put it like that. And we had to engage in healthcare systems through the ER. And I remember the providers that treated us like crap. And they knew that we were, you know, on government assistance. And then I remember providers that treated us well. And I, it was a goal of mine whenever I became a healthcare provider that I always wanted to treat people well. They ate, yeah, that's perfect. Nice, strong heart rate. By the time I got into midwifery school, it was such a buildup to finally, like, be in this place. I just remember being like so excited. And of course my preceptor who's like been to tons of births who just was kind of like, come on girl, this brand new student and like shoved me in the room. I just remember how magical it was. I still remember her name. We had this beautiful hands and knees birth. And I just remember looking like, thank you for letting me catch your baby. And like being like, excuse me. And then walking out the room and like sobbing. It was so tremendous. I just couldn't believe like, I was finally here after like doing so much to finally get there. No. My squishy newborns. I love newborn exams. Who doesn't like a squishy newborn? Let's see, what gifts do you have in here for us? I still get excited. I still get like very, very happy. I love catching siblings. You know, I've worked with families that I've caught you know, for their children. From what I can feel, mm -hmm. the back is over here mm -hmm. and the head is r right there. Mm -hmm. You wanna try to feel it? Yeah. All right, so the best way to do it when you're pregnant. But I also still have like that same joy with getting to teach somebody about their body, working with somebody to, you know, have a baby. I'm commonly asked like, what's the bigger difference between midwives and a doc? Midwives have a different philosophy on pregnancy and birth. We don't see it as a disease, a medical condition that we need to fix. We see it as a normal life transition that we need to support you through. But the bigger issue too is that we're not high risk doctors. We're not surgeons. If you are super, super sick, you really should not be seeing a midwife. Hi. I still run into people who say, Oh, you're a midwife, so that means you're a doula, right? And I'm like, nope, very different. And the way I like to explain it is that like a, a doula, her focus is for the support and comfort for this mother. So I'm gonna let you up, okay? Okay. All right. Yeah, that feels a lot. It feels great. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can like shake it a little bit. Okay. Like this. I'm the clinical person. I'm making sure clinically that the, the birthing person is okay and the baby's okay. So very, very different. Okay. It's definitely a more personal experience when you have midwives and doulas from just a basic doctor appointment. It, sometimes that can feel like you're talking to a stranger about your problems. A lot of people say, oh, I'm gonna fall asleep, Zoe. I'm like, don't do that. Right. <laughs> With my doula, Zoe, she'll educate me on my birth and she'll still be there for me after the baby's born, which is great. And then you can do it the other way too. So like you can lay, lay okay. with somebody like this. This is like a grandma yeah. hug. It is, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's another great position. Too. Okay. All right. I got interested in working with birthing people, pregnant people, it's just stemming from my own experience. I was a teen mom in the 90s, and back then there were not a lot of services. I had my baby, he was a healthy baby boy. But I had a lot of experiences in the healthcare system that were honestly traumatizing, where I felt that I didn't have a voice, I didn't have agency, that people made decisions for me that didn't include me. 
as I've just progressed in my life, in my career, I really wanted to work with young parents and birthing people. What was her birth weight? Seven pounds. Seven pounds? Yeah. And she's today seven pounds, 12 ounces? You are doing fantastic, but also a lot of like encouragement, empowerment. Deb, you feel better? You got some milks? That's good milks, huh? She's like, I want some more. I try to let them know, like, look how great this baby is, um, because I think that's also kind of missing from a lot of care. I commonly will talk about this with my staff to take away that it's not about you. It's about the families that we're trying to take care of and life, life is hard. We're gonna see late prenatal patients and we're gonna see late babies. I don't care if she's 15 minutes late, four hours late, we're gonna see them. I was like, guys, you gotta trust me. This is really important. What I found is some people would come into the office and be like, I'm so glad you saw me. I had no idea that this morning was gonna start like this, but thank you for seeing me. What's most frustrating are sometimes barriers that are outside of our control to do anything about. We have a lot of patients who are trying to remain stably housed in Washington, D.C., and that's really tough with the changing of the neighborhoods around us and the rapid gentrification that we're seeing in the city. As someone who is from Washington, D.C., several generations of my family are from D.C., it's really hard to see people not able to stay within our community because they're being priced out. Racism is about power. And like we are trying to break down those power dynamics. I think what you see is free black folk. They feel comfortable being who they are and expressing who they are. And yes, you don't find that a lot of different places. Hey! Hello, lovey. She's putting makeup on. And so I'm spoiled. And it makes it really hard for me to think about being anywhere else because I know I can't go into a lot of spaces and feel safe and feel, um, you know, able to be free. We're trying to create a space for this, this moment, this pivotal moment in your life, this sacred moment that you only have a few times to do that will change the rest of your life, that will change the course of your ancestry, that will change the course of your family. That space should be sacred, it should be celebrated. It should be a space where you are protected, where you are loved. That's what we're trying to do. What a powerful documentary. I actually want to take a few moments to take a breath and just sit with what we've seen. And um, although for some it may be hard to express, we do really want to understand your direct feelings at this moment in time after watching the film and the documentary. So we hope that you'll be able to answer the questions on your screen. So which statement best describes how you are feeling at this moment after watching Birthing Justice? Shocked, not surprised, overwhelmed, motivated. And for those who are feeling different emotions, we do encourage you to include those in the question and answer box.
All right, if we can see the responses. Okay, so I'm happy to see that many of us on this call are motivated. I am motivated as well. And I think that leads us into our amazing panel discussion. And I really do believe this is going to be a fruitful discussion. And I think before we get into introducing our panelists, I do wanna leave us by thinking about if the health of a society can be measured by its maternal and infant mortality rates. What the data in this documentary so clearly highlights is that the United States, the world leader is ailing. But the goal of this discussion and our panel, as you'll see, is really to talk about those solutions and hear it from our expert panelists. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Cheryl Franklin. She's the Associate Professor of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. We next are welcomed by Dr. Keisha Gaither, the Director of Perinatal Services and Maternal Fetal Medicine at New York City Health and Hospitals at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. She's also an Associate Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Cornell School of Medicine. We also are joined by Dr. Joyce Jaroge. She's an Advanced Heart Failure Transplant Cardiology Fellow at Stanford University in California with clinical and research interest in inherited cardiomyopathies and healthcare disparities, particularly as it pertains to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Next, we're joined by Dr. Camila Phillips, a New York-based OBGYN and founder of Kyla Women's Health, a comprehensive women's health center which provides high quality, personalized and inclusive healthcare. We're also joined by Mylin Rowland, a certified nurse midwife at Valley Women for Women in my current stopping grounds in Gilbert, Arizona. And lastly, we're joined by Monique Matthews, a Los Angeles-based writer and director who's the co-writer and director of this amazing and powerful docu-film we just saw, Birthing Justice. Thank you ladies for joining. I'm now gonna hand it over to Dr. Ansung to get us started with a few questions. Thank you, ladies. So first, I want to encourage our attendees to please enter your questions into the text box, and we'll answer them as we go along. So to our panelists, facts show that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of maternal mortality in Black women with conditions like preeclampsia. Facts also show that these deaths are largely preventable, but rarely prevented in Black women. In fact, Dr. Franklin, in the film, Dr. Creer Perry says that Black women who are normal weight, have a college education, and the same wealth as white women are still more likely to die with a year of childbirth than their white counterparts. So we cannot buy or educate or even exercise our way out of this crisis. The data shows that even when we do all these things, we're still more likely to die. What point is she trying to make and what is the cause of this? Thank you for that question. Well, as you might imagine, there's been very much speculation about the reasons Black women suffer excess maternal morbidity and mortality. Factors like obesity, poverty, and lower educational attainment have all been things that have been postulated. However, even when such factors are controlled for, we find that Black women are still more adversely affected in fact, looking at national data from 2007 through 2016, the CDC found that Black women with at least a college degree had five times, five times the pregnancy-related mortality rates compared to their white counterparts. So then you have to look at other contextual factors to understand these disparities. The insidious current and historical experiences of racism, such as repeated microaggressions, implicit bias, unequal access and treatment, and all of the manifestations of racism which impact Black women in every socially determinate domain, transportation, safe and sustainable housing, nutrition, pollution, job security, crime and incarceration, community resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these non-clinical factors make a significant difference to outcomes. 
Thank you, Dr. Franklin, for that um, exceptional response. And I actually want to change the question a little bit and direct this to Dr. Gaither, um, one of our expert maternal fetal medicine physicians on the panel. You know, as we heard in this docufilm, and as you obviously know very intimately, preeclampsia is one of the leading causes of death among Black women. And I have a twofold question to you. We heard Allison Felix's story. In your opinion, what played a significant role in Allison and her child being able to survive? And more importantly, although Allison Felix, like many mothers, presented prematurely with preeclampsia, we do know that preeclampsia can occur even in the postpartum, up to six weeks postpartum to be exact. So as a maternal fetal medicine physician, are there anything that we can do to better address diagnosing that condition and making sure that these mothers get appropriate treatment as soon as possible. Okay, so in answering the first question, I think the factor that was most important in you know, identifying Mrs. Felix's condition was the fact that her physician recognized it, okay? That, that was the primary um, factor that accounted for her, her survival and a, and a good outcome. Um, preeclampsia is a master, uh, uh, how do I put it? It emulates a lot of other um, illnesses. It has very subtle symptoms sometimes. It, and such that many physicians may not be cognizant of it. You know, oh, I have a headache. Is it a headache due to preeclampsia and the subsequent edema that may be occurring? Or is that a migraine? Oh, you know, I feel short of breath. Well, do you have asthma or a cold or are your lungs filling with fluid? You know, my stomach really hurts, particularly on the right side. Do you have gas or is this your liver beginning to have symptoms from severe preeclampsia and precluding uh, an episode of liver rupture. So, you know, preeclampsia is the great imitator. So I, I, you know, in trying to determine whether or not the survivability factor um, can be improved, I think it can be improved with more education of physicians to identify early signs and symptoms of preeclampsia and not just to think, oh, she's got a migraine or, oh, she's got some indigestion. And I think it, it falls not only on the physician, but also on the patients as well to, to kind of know these signs and symptoms. One of the things that I think is really important is to have an educational session with patients the first time you see them and kind of get them in the habit of you know, listening and monitoring their signs and symptoms and, you know, to present it to the physician. So not only is the physician cognizant and tuned to it, but the patient is as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaither. Uh, data has shown that midwifery led care improves health outcomes among birthing women worldwide, leading to lower rates of C-sections, preterm births, and anemia. The World Health Organization has identified midwifery as playing a vital role in lowering global maternal and newborn mortality, and is particularly beneficial for women of color in the United States, where more people of color and more people from marginalized communities are looking into alternative birth options. My Lynn, can you share with us what the difference is between a midwife and a member of the team we have not yet talked about, a doula? Yes, um, thank you for the question. I always get this question. Um, the, the first question I get, well, what's the difference between a midwife and a physician? The physicians are the experts in women's health throughout the lifespan, and they manage gynecological issues, perform GYN and OB related surgeries, and provide care during pregnancy, labor, delivery, and the postpartum period. And they deal with that high risk population. Midwives are healthcare providers that offer medical care to that low risk mother and child in pregnancy, labor and delivery and in the postpartum period. The concept of a midwife is to be with the woman. We try to encourage the woman to believe in the natural process of labor and delivery 
And we try to keep interventions at a minimum and help the mother and family to get the birthing experience that she desires. But if interventions are necessary, and sometimes they are, we are always keeping the mothers and the families informed about what is needed to promote the best outcomes for both the mother and the baby, while still encouraging her to be the decision making maker in her care. Uh, sometimes there's a misconception that all midwives deliver at homes or in birthing centers, which can sometimes make a person feel like they can't get an epidural or they can't have certain things because it's not available to them. But depending upon the type of training and certification a midwife has will determine the extent of their responsibilities mm -hmm. and the settings in which the midwife practices. So unlike physicians, midwives don't do or perform major surgeries, but they may be able to perform minor procedures such as repairing a laceration after a delivery. Your most common type of midwife, I'm not gonna go through all of them or in detail, but your most common types of midwife in the United States in today's midwifery practice are your certified nurse midwives, your certified midwives, and your certified professional midwives. Your certified midwives and certified professional nurse midwives are usually um, in a hospital setting, but they can work in all settings. Whereas your certified professional midwives will, you'll see them more so in the birth center or the home setting. And usually those midwives are only dealing with the low risk mom and the child during pregnancy, birth and the postpartum. Doulas, the difference between the doulas and the midwives, doulas provide continuous physical, emotional, mental, and sometimes spiritual support to the woman and her family during pregnancy, uh, during childbirth and the postpartum period. Uh, doulas may provide education for breastfeeding support, nutritional support, and postpartum recovery care. They're very big on advocating for the mother and families and believing in self-advocacy. The difference with, between the midwife and the doula is that doulas are not trained in medical assessments, diagnosis, or treatments. They cannot perform cervical exams or catch babies. So they often have to defer their medical assessments, questions, concerns, to the medical providers, such as the midwives or physicians. Thank you, Mylon, for such a thorough definition of the roles of the different providers on the care team. Dr. Phillips, do you think you can expand upon this from an OBGYN perspective and how each of these uh, roles is important in maternal care? Mm -hmm. Just checking in, making sure you can hear me. Okay, great. So I like to think of our role as well as the midwife and the doula, certainly as complementary. I like to think of us as working in a birth team for the interests of the patient, the baby, and her family. So uh, never more like of a hierarchy, but really in complementary um, exercise together. So the OB specifically has four years of undergrad training, four years of medical school, four years of residency, and then anywhere from one to three years of additional training um, that constitutes a fellowship that gives additional skills. Um, in that time, we do deep dive on complex surgery. We learn uh, surgical how to manage uh, surgical complications, operative deliveries, and really how to navigate a coordination of care for people who are both routine in their pregnancy, but also people who are having complications, specifically hemorrhage, uh, preeclampsia, preterm labor, people who have fibroids in uh, pregnancy, which is also very common in our population. So I'd like to think of us as um, sort of a navigator for this process that we also do consider a very normal lifespan process. But when the life or the body decides to make a left, we are there to keep mothers and babies safe with perhaps a higher level of care and surgery if needed. Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips, as well as my Lynn for that very thorough understanding of the differences. And I want to turn my next question actually to Dr. Jeroge 
Um, one really powerful set part of the segment of the docufilm was uh, set by a historian, Dr. Jason Glenn, and he had mentioned that there are two things at play here. It's not that racism, it's not just the racism that exists in a clinical setting between provider and patient, but there's the accumulated biological effects of the lived experiences of racism that is also impacting us. So Dr. Jaroge, can you speak to the science behind what he's actually saying? How does racism actually impact a patient's maternal health? Thank you so much. So, you know, centuries of systemic and interpersonal racism has profound impact on communities of colors, affecting where they live, learn, work, worship, and receive health care, which drive health inequities. And on a higher level, that impacts the rates of illnesses, including diabetes, hypertension, obesity, asthma, and overall heart uh, disease, as well as life expectancy compared to white people. But on a deeper level, study, studies have shown um, the effect of stress on overall cardiovascular risk is there. So recent studies have demonstrated abnormal gut microbiome or the you know, healthy bacteria in the stomach, so the bacterial environment in your gut can be affected by perceived levels of stress, um, causing inflammatory processes and illnesses. There's also abnormal cortisol level or release that can affect oxidative, oxidative stress on a cellular level, and that's also associated with chronic stress. And then we also see worse effects on mental health disease and severity, and all of these directly impact your cardiovascular risk, as well as overall poor health. Absolutely. And, you know, it's relevant to highlight that pregnancy sometimes is the first cardiac stress test a female may go through. And it's really that reason why the Association of Black Cardiologists is trying to take the lead when it comes to particularly the Black maternal health crisis and the intersection of maternal health and cardiovascular disease. In 2021, the ABC was able to publish the Working Agenda for Black Mothers, which was a position paper with really in solutions to the Black maternal health crisis. And this was published in the American Heart Association's journal, Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. I want to uh, hand this question over to you again, Dr. Jaroge, because you were one of the co-authors of this paper. So can you share some of the key solutions that were covered in the paper to combat the, combat the issues, particularly the issue of racism? Yeah, so the paper was, it was wonderful working with you, Dr. Vaughn, and everyone else. And it was very thorough pointing out um, important targets as well as possible solutions. I'll name a few. First, number one, listening to black women when they present with whatever symptom or concern. And I don't think that needs to be explained further. It's just that black and white. Um, number two, on the medical side, promoting collaborative care team models as standard of practice is really important. So that includes not just having a heart doctor with your ob guide, with everyone else on your team, your anesthesiologist, the person who's going to be managing your um, pain medication or sedation if you're going for a C-section, but also having a doula and a midwife available if you're interested. And then for the patients or family members or whoever allies are there with you, realizing that this is an option to advocate for and knowing the benefits of having a doula or a midwife included, because studies have demonstrated that for Black women, their birthing outcomes, including rates of preterm uh, deliveries as well as C-section, have been lower when they had doulas or midwives involved. Three, we talked about community outreach programs and faith-based community partnerships to meet patients where they are in order to combat the effect of medical distrust, which is for very good reasons, so ingrained in our interpersonal relationships with our patients. And then the media can be a really great uh, resource to inform the masses, but still requires a more diverse media workforce to support sharing these stories, these black women's stories. Um, lastly, I wanted to highlight also the really important part of preconception counseling and early medical care access and realizing for yourself before you're even thinking about getting pregnant, make sure you take care of mom so that you can take care of baby. And um, I just wanted to highlight that the Association of Black Cardiologists has continued to collaborate with multiple organizations and groups to support funding opportunities to better study and serve the Black community regarding maternal morbidity and mortality using strategies that target the prenatal, peripartum, as well as postpartum periods.
Thank you so much, Dr. Jorogues. So with these dismal statistics uh, for Black women, more and more Black women are raising concerns and fear of becoming pregnant. Um, so much they fear dying. With the documentary and the ABC's mission of also sharing stories of experiencing the Black joy of motherhood, Dr. Philip, as an obst obstetric healthcare professional, have you been a witness to these fears from Black women? And how do you best counsel women on these worries? So I have absolutely been witness to these fears. I mean, we can't help it when we see um, stories about Serena Williams and this um, documentary noting here, prominent women having issues in pregnancy. We think, why can't that happen to us? Why wouldn't that happen to us? So I think one thing that's really important that I try to do is acknowledge her fear. It is not fair that we pretend that the elephant is not in the room. It's important that we acknowledge her fear because when we don't, we continue to perpetuate the stereotype that we're not listening. And it's because we're not. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge her fear and really allow her to get that fear out into the space so we can discuss it. I think it's important that patients feel comfortable talking to their healthcare provider about race. I talk to my patients about race. I talk to them about the things that um, may impact them as a function of race, which we are really acknowledging is racism. And this helps them have an understanding of how we can strategize for them to have healthy pregnancies. So I think the best counsel is by listening to them, acknowledging their fears. And also during the prenatal care that I'm giving, I present them with scenarios so that if again, the healthcare process turns a left, she is prepared in understanding what it is that we are going to do in order to best take care of her. So I listen to their concerns. I help strategize ahead of time before we perhaps enter any um, healthcare issues that might be perilous. And to Dr. Droge's point, preparing for pregnancy is so important. It is so important for us to have a cardiologist on board, to have a pulmonologist on board, a hematologist on board, so that when you are pregnant, we can make sure that we have a team of people taking best care of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. And Monique, as the director and co-writer of Birthing Justice, why was it just as important to share these stories of Black joy as it was to share the near misses featured in the full-length documentary? Well, one, I, I wanna say happy World Physicians Day to all my wonderful doctors here. I know that uh, some of you only make up 2%. And so it's so just wonderful to be in a minority where all of you are here. So, you know, congratulations. Uh, for me, it's, you know, we were the, 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 the post question is, you know, very few people were surprised about what's happening, right? We know what's happening. And the power of story allows us to bear witness um, to humanize and to, uh, for doctors, because sometimes it can feel as if you're yelling at the sky, it provides data. Like you can, you can see these like, Hey, well, just look at this. And it can, it can help people along the way. So, um, my job as a filmmaker and understanding the importance of storytelling is to, um, to bear witness. I, I mean, I really listen to a lot of different women and, and men and birthing people to really just, bring the human element out because a lot of times when we look at statistics, we can, they, we, there's so much coming at us in our lives that it can just be overwhelming. We can just kind of move past it. But when we stop and we just kind of listen um, and see just what's happening, then, you know, momentum can shift. So for me, storytelling is just really to bear witness and to um, help you and, and the data help you all do better jobs and, and let's have some healthy babies. Thank you so much, Monique. And I, I want to ask a question for you again, just because I think your uh, commentary was very powerful. But with these stories, women obviously are understanding what these staggering statistics show, but also a big part of the film was to also demonstrate the near misses and the Black joy that can come from giving birth to a child. What we wanted to understand is how do you feel Black women should be best heard and empowered to advocate for themselves? Because sometimes 
many of these black women don't have wonderful obstetric health professionals like those on our panel today, and they do need to self advocate for themselves. So what advice would you give to women out there on how to do that? Well, I mean, in the and the reason why I focus so much on Black Joy is that when we look at the statistics and even, you know, we've been promoting the film, some people just hear it and they, oh, it's so sad. And it's just like, once people hear it's sad, they stop paying attention, right? And it's like, I really, one of my favorite things of every year when we have Martin Luther King Jr. holiday is the pictures inevitably, if we can find them of him playing pool or him playing cards, and it seems like that's the, you know, that's the, the, the recess. And actually, I think that joy fueled the movement. It fueled the brotherhood. It fueled the, it fueled the sisterhood. It fueled the resistance. And we don't always talk about how resistance, joyful resistance helps us get up every day when things get hard. So that was incredibly important for me to say it's not an aside. It's actually, it's this tool, it's a tool as much as people have used anger. But you know, just being on this panel with cardiologists, you know what anger can do to the body in terms of it breaking down. I mean, anger is great for setting boundaries but we need tools that we can use to move forward. So for me, Black Joy was a very specific tool that, that we have used um, as Africans and African-Americans, Africans in this country to resist. You know, we'll have the fish fry. We'll have Friday nights at my grandmother's house was everything growing up. And they they didn't have the best jobs, the best lives. They had, you know, a lot of the hypertension, a lot of the things we discussed, but it was that it was that communion. It was making people laugh. It was, and that gave us the energy to go out and do it again. So, you know, for women, um, from, from my angle as a witness, it's, you know, find people who, help you affirm that life is worth living and that it's joyful for you. And one of the things that we found consistently in terms of bearing witness is, you know, we don't want too much responsibility to be placed on the women because one of the things that we found is that Black women, we, we're we super women because they're like, well, if you do this, this is going to happen. Well, if you do this, this is going to happen. And, you know, it's like Dr. Joya says, it's like we control for all of these things and we're still, we're still at, at risk. So we were really careful in the film that while we show the near misses and while we want to encourage women not to have women blame themselves, because sometimes as a self-advocate, a woman can say, well, if I should have did this, but it's so hard. Sometimes it's so scary. It's so overwhelming. I mean, your body is not your own during this time. It's a very unique experience. There's so many emotions flooding. Um, you know, we love having doctors who care for us, but that can be very intimidating uh, for many people. So it's, as a witness, have friends that can just ask the questions that you want while affirming joy. Because I, I really, we really backed away from um, having women be as self-advocates for everything because we blame ourselves for a lot of institutional stuff that we can't really fix on our own. Thank you. I, I concur with that. And, you know, just on the subject of self-advocacy, we know that there's lots of data that show when you are under the care of somebody who you can identify best with, outcomes are better. I want to bring this actual question to my Lynn. Um, do you feel that it is easier to promote this self-advocacy when you provide racially concordant care, even for yourself as a certified nurse midwife, where there is a shared identity between the clinician as yourself and the patient regarding your race? Absolutely. I feel it's easier because it re it reduces that feeling of isolation. I've lived in like two predominantly Black cities where I was the one looking for the Black provider. And it wasn't until I got in Arizona where the Black population here is less than 7% that I realized how important it was to have a more diverse population, especially of Black providers. Black families, they tend to seek out Black providers for various reasons. It could be from a personal traumatic experience or generational experiences or beliefs that they feel like they can only see a Black provider. Whatever the case, when you see that person, that mom or patient walk into your your room at, you know, in the office, there's like a weight lifted off of their shoulder when they see a face that is similar to theirs. I love asking questions about, you know, something outside of just healthcare, just to get to know them. And then I share things about myself because then it builds trust. And I believe that 
women and their families are more willing to share, probably some more than others, um, when they feel comfortable in the presence of someone that they feel that they can connect to. I think that um, if I have, whenever I have to refer a patient out, I, you know, I have you, Dr. Bond, you've gotten me spoiled where I can just pick up the phone and provide that continuity of care um, that they're looking for if they have to see someone outside of me. So I, I think it's, it's, it definitely uh, creates a better environment, better outcomes when they feel like they have someone that they can connect to. Thank you, Mylan. I couldn't agree with you more about connecting with our patients and really getting to know their stories. And on the conversation of racially concordant care, data shows when babies are delivered by Black doctors, their mortality rate is cut in half. This is challenging because we have a limited number of Black doctors and clinicians in healthcare as a result of historical inequities and the way the healthcare system has been built for us. The ABC supports and actively is working to increase the pipeline because data also shows that clinicians who work in a more diverse workforce have better outcomes. With that in mind, Dr. Gaither, how can we as Black female clinicians equip clinicians, particularly even our male clinicians, with knowledge and tools to better treat women in general, but especially pregnant women of color? Um, I think there are a number of ways. Um, certainly to have uh, uncomfortable discussions sometimes during our meetings, um, such that they recognize that there is a plight. I think it's important to have patient surveys, ask the patients for feedback on their care, and then let that metric uh, likely be something that is discussed when, you know, it's time for the physician's review such that they can kind of get it. Um, I think there needs to be maternal mortality review committees, um, which continually um, go over near misses and things that could have been done better to continually educate and, you know, keep things in the back of people's minds as, oh, well, maybe I should do this because that happened the last time. Um, I think that for the powers that be within any institution, there should be a real recognition and a push to increase perinatal diversity in the healthcare providers that exist. Um, I think that's very important. I think having conversations such as this, webinars um, promotes the thinking, the thought, the, the mindset. Um, I think there are quite a lot of things that can um, assist skills development and behavioral change and communication classes can also assist. Um, just to adopt some mandatory standards to ensure respect and safe and quality care. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Gaither. I really feel strongly about everything that you said. And one thing that the Association of Black Cardiologists is trying to do is also provide tools to both patient and clinician so they can have these conversations. We're really fortunate because this past February, we launched phase two of the We Are the Faces of Black Maternal Health campaign. And this campaign actually did provide a few infographics that are with lots of information for not just the community, but also clinicians. So I wanna direct my next question to Dr. Franklin. Being you led some of the efforts within our writing and working group for the We Are the Faces campaign, in referencing the infographics in particular, what tips do you have for women to advocate for themselves prior to pregnancy, throughout their pregnancy, before they get to the delivery room, and during that critical time while they're in the hospital during labor and delivery, as well as their post-delivery process? Thank you, Dr. Bond. But first and foremost, there has to be an understanding that uh, pregnancy, as we said earlier, really is nature's stress test on the body. And a healthy pregnancy depends on good health throughout the lifespan. So prior to pregnancy, it's very important to optimize your health, including health, heart healthy nutrition and fitness, uh, immunizations, uh, cancer screenings, et cetera. 
and optimize underlying chronic conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, cardiovascular disease. Understand your family history and your own risk factors. Get preconceptual counseling for you and for your partner. And if you have an underlying cardiovascular disorder, involve a cardiologist in your care. During your pregnancy, the nature stress test, early and regular prenatal care is paramount. Address risk factors for pregnancy-induced hypertension. Uh, if you're a first-time mom, you have a history of high blood pressure, a family history of preeclampsia, you're carrying twins or triplets, you're less than 20 years old or greater than 40 years old, you uh, have obesity, or, uh, and, or with Black women in, uh, in general are at increased risk of pregnancy-induced hypertension. Your uh, clinician may recommend that you start a low-dose aspirin ideally between 12 to 16 weeks, uh, but definitely before 28 weeks gestation. You may benefit from remote blood pressure monitoring. And certain conditions, you wanna have a cardiology referral or be involved with a pregnancy heart team at your facility. And very important, develop and strengthen social supports. Social supports all by themselves, have been shown to improve health outcomes. After delivery, you can't uh, decide that that's not an important time. It's actually the most vulnerable time other than the actual day of delivery. 53% of maternal deaths occur between uh, one week and one year after delivery. After uh, delivery, you want to have a two to three week check in with your clinician that can be in person via telemedicine, remote monitoring, uh, using community health workers, or some sort of remote uh, monitoring service. If you have hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, you may be monitored in the hospital for two to three days and then follow up with, uh, within two weeks. Any of um, those uh, postpartum uh, checkups, particularly during the first three months, uh, which we now call the fourth trimester, needs to include mental health screening uh, for depression and anxiety as well. You want to make sure that you attend your five to six week postpartum checkup and more checkups if, you have an out if you've had an adverse pregnancy outcome or if you have a chronic condition. Remember that that whole first year is a vulnerable time period and is now thankfully covered by many insurers, including Medicaid in many states. And during that time period postpartum, you want to successfully transition to a primary care provider and any other subspecialists for conditions that have been uncovered uh, during pregnancy. And then long-term, your childbirthing experience matters. Please understand the predictive impact or long-term risk of having had an adverse pregnancy outcome. These are things like preterm birth, small for gestational age or growth restriction, gestational diabetes, or any hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And then commit to monitoring and managing your long-term health. By the way, some evidence even suggests that children born to moms with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy have increased cardiovascular risk themselves. You wanna maintain a healthy lifestyle, don't smoke, maintain a healthy weight, eat a heart-healthy diet, be physically active, monitor and maintain normal blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, and last but not least, manage stress. Be spiritually active and sleep. Thank you so much, Dr. Franklin. Great, great advice that we can, we can all use. One of the things that you mentioned was the importance of having a very strong uh, support network. And as we know, part of that network 
are the fathers of our Black moms. And what often gets forgotten is what they go through after they've lost their, their significant other and their wives. We've heard these stories, including that of Charles Johnson, the father of two, whose wife, Kira, died in Los Angeles during childbirth in 2016. He turned his anger into advocacy and launched the organization for Kira for Moms. The ABC is fortunate to have had Mr. Johnson participate in our working agenda for Black Mothers Roundtable in 2020. Monique, in writing the docu documentary, did you factor in these fathers' voices? One of the most amazing things is that the fathers were just there. So in terms of factoring in their voices, they they just kept showing up. And, um, you know, when we were shooting, they just had, they, they were there. They were very active. It was really important for us to center Black women um, while we wanted to bring in Black men and the capacities that, you know, because everyone doesn't have a nuclear family. So we didn't, we, we really wanted to be mindful that, that the the nuclear structure may not be everyone's structure, but we wanted to you know acknowledge everyone who's in, involved in a biological birth. Uh, so that was important to us that we really center the women so that we can really listen to Black women. Like that was that was key. Uh, but within that, that doesn't mean that we forget dads or you know fathers or uncles because there's so many ways that Black men show up for their families. And they showed up in the film and that was just wonderful. I did make sure to include when we were in the editing, like I wanted to make sure, like particularly when we were in, in um, St. Louis and the couple who lost their their child, I really wanted the the father's voice to be in there because I thought it was, he, he did so much research and it was just, it was so heartbreaking, heartbreaking when I found out that I, I did make sure in editing that it was inclusive, though Black women were centered. Thank you so much. And Dr. Phillips, in your perspective, how can medical professionals and people in the community better empower Black men during the process of pregnancy so that they are more equipped to navigate the maternal health care system? Yeah. Thank you for that question. I'm just sitting here almost getting emotional when I think about a, a Black family at their delivery and whether it's you know our, our traditional nuclear family or in general. Um, it's a wonderful experience. And I know we're talking about like the things that can happen, but just remember, it's a beautiful experience. And so to answer your question, I think that one thing that medical professionals and people in the community can do is actually take just a second to recognize our own bias and maybe um, misgivings about Black men in this space and really try and dismantle our own stereotypes about their presence or their the way they communicate or express um, love or fear or anxiety. I think that's something really important that we acknowledge um, that so that they can also have the space to release uh, energy that may be negative or positive so that they can then center the mother. So I think there's a few things. Um, one, I always encourage um, the people that I work with to make sure the, the, the fathers are there. I address them by their name talk to them when they're in the visit. They are present in an integral part of this woman's life and this baby's life. And even if they can't make the visit, that's fine. That's when we use technology and bring in FaceTime so that they can be there to hear the conversations about their loved one's care. Um, I ask them directly, uh, fathers to express any fears that they might have because if the woman is coming to me saying I'm scared I don't want to die then I know he has fears as well and I think it's really important to take time to acknowledge what those are again so we can process them and help him then acknowledge what is going on with him so that he in turn can stay in tune and focus with the, the birthing woman um, and that's really important. The other thing that I think that is the community and professionals we can do is, this might be a stereotype, but men like to do, men like to fix, that has been my experience. And so I give them homework. Um, I give them homework, not only to help them be proactive in educating themselves about birth and labor and postpartum and how to care for a baby, but also to take some of that weight off of the Black woman. She has a lot going on already. And so if the father can 
read the books, find the pediatrician, figure out the car seat, find the doula. These are things that take stress off of the birthing person and also brings the father into uh, the prenatal care and postpartum care. And then finally, I think in having these very open conversations with the father about um, how delivery goes, what things are expected, it gives them a real understanding um, of how they can engage themselves in that delivery process. Um, we, I think it's important that we physically bring them in, we emotionally bring them in, spiritually and psychologically. And again, they are part of our birth team. They are part of our birth team. And there is nothing more moving than when that little curly head pops out and the dad goes, oh, you know, and he's excited because he's usually the first one that sees that little beautiful brown face. It really is just a 360 moment for them. And so um, they are a really important part of our birth team that the community and medical professionals need to embrace. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Phillips. I truly, I could actually remember my dad over and over and over describing the first time seeing me and just the experience he had, which is beautiful. Now we have so many questions from the audience and I actually wanna to get to those questions um, to try to circle it back to the clinician because earlier on, Dr. Gaither, you talked a lot about going over the signs and symptoms of many of these adverse pregnancy outcomes. And most importantly, we know that many clinicians out there are not doing that. So one question from the audience was, how are we best educating physicians as well as clinicians to dig a little deeper? And I will start with you, Dr. Gaither, if you don't mind, to give us a good insight as to what you think would be the best way that we can maybe um, either alter or improve the education that we have right now. That way we do dig deeper for a lot of these sometimes missed complications. Um, again, I think, you know, involving physicians in these types of, of webinars, um, grand rounds, having people come in, giving case, you know, studies, okay, this is how she presented, and this is this, this is some of the things that you should think about, um, holding, uh, what do you call those things, um, basically where you have a paper of, of a particular subject, and you discuss it. Uh, these are the signs and symptoms of this particular illness. Um, this is what you need to do. Um, going to com conferences. Um, those, are, those are some of the best ways, I think, to kind of increase um, recognition of some of the more um, uh, elusive types of illnesses. And um, perhaps Dr. Jaroga, you could answer this question because touching upon um, improving clinical education, we know a lot of times research helps with that. So what role do you feel clinical research can play in reducing black maternal mortality? Yeah, I thought that was a wonderful question. Someone else pointed out the importance of first surveying our, our moms to see how their experience has been collecting that data and then, you know, we need more registries as well. We need more um, objective data included. And I think uh, another barrier that may come up is, you know, that medical distrust that I mentioned earlier. Why would someone say, yes, I will sign for you to take all of my um, lab work and, and collect all of my medical data when I know the history with Henrietta Lacks and um, Dr. Sims and his OB uh, determinations over the years. So um, it comes back to also diversifying the face of a medicine, as well as researchers, as well as any person who is interacting with um, our patients so that we can build that, that, that communication, that connection so that they can trust enough to say, yes, I see why you wanna do this and I wanna be part of that solution. Thank you. And, you know, we talked a lot about collaborative care models and really revamping the education. We are joined by a medical student. And I'm going to pose this question to Dr. Franklin, um, someone who's in academic medicine. How can a medical student play a role in addressing this particular issue? What can they do? Well, first of all, congratulations to the medical student. But uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine, 
we have learners of, of all types. And so we have uh, medical students, we have uh, uh, PA students, we are, um, we have uh, science uh, students, et cetera. And we try to involve all of our learners, including our uh, resident physicians, et cetera, in all of the, the projects and all of the um, our clinical departments, our basic science departments, et cetera. And so one of the things that medical students can do is to uh, become involved if it's women's health that you're interested in, you'll have um, several different avenues at your institution uh, for that, that being the uh, OBGYN department, that being a, a public health uh, department, if you have one uh, at your institution. Um, we at an institution like ours tend to be involved with community um, services that do a women's health, uh, uh, women's health direct service delivery, but also advocacy organizations uh, with women's health. We involve ourselves with um, government um, uh, systems and government services that are responsible for um, healthcare delivery to women, like the you know Department of, of Public Health. Um, so there are many different ways. I would say find a, a mentor at your institution who's uh, involved in the areas that you want to be involved with, and there will likely be many opportunities. Uh, for becoming involved in this in this work. Dr. Phillips, you want to weigh in? I will keep this really brief only because I had this experience in medical school and I think it pertains to all of us. Call out racism and bias when you see it. Okay, there's obviously professional way that you can do that, but I think that it is very important because some of our counterparts don't even know when their bias entering into their decision-making that can negatively affect a patient. So calling out racism and bias um, is important. Absolutely. And, you know, this question is for Monique, because I think many of us were just moved so much by the docufilm. And, you know, you can read the commentary in the Q&A at your convenience. But one thing that we really wanted to understand is how do you think a film like the docufilm you created is going to translate into the impact that the U.S. no longer will be the most dangerous place among high income countries to give birth? Well, thank you for for those kind words. Thank you. It's, you know, we made this to have impact. So we made this for, you know, we didn't just want a talking heads piece. We we have, you know, very specific people who are affecting change. And it's, you know, it's not just the conversations that are happening. It's like Dr. Phillips says, like you call it out, you say, well, we're making time for this. We are being very strategic with grassroots screening so that people can come together locally and and decide enough is enough and talk to their local politicians and just locally deal with the hospitals and and have that just so there's you know that we have at the the level of lawmakers and then we have just in terms of as our rollout so i mean our goal in terms of affecting things is for regular people to interact with each other and say how do we solve this where we are because everyone is at a different place but this film can be used on um, multiple levels by multiple, by different people to affect what needs to happen. Perfect. And um, Mylen, you know, one question that was asked earlier was about using the laborious midwife model. Um, obviously, as a midwife, this is something you're intimately aware of. Do you think by putting that model across sort of the course of the maternal continuum? that would possibly help to reduce the maternal mortality rates that we're seeing. Absolutely, because I think that when we grasp the concept of being with the woman in the family on a continuous basis, um, you get to pick up one more things. And so as a midwife, even though I deal with that low risk population, it is my responsibility to be able to recognize those things that fall out of the norm and to direct that patient or client in the direction that promotes better health care.
<laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I just wanna thank our panelists so much for uh, their contributions uh, to this webinar that we have. And as a reminder, um, our attendees will be receiving a post-screening survey uh, from the film production company. And so finally, we have been very fortunate tonight to take this eye-opening journey through the Black maternal health crisis. The truth-telling stories presented in Birthing Justice have personified the dismal statistics for a Black woman. Yet these stories do offer us a glimmer of hope. We can fix this if we all work together. We hope you walk away ready to join with ABC and others to address these disparities. Thank you to our panelists for continuing the conversation surrounding Black maternal health. I'd like to extend this gratitude to the ABC for their continued advocacy in this space. For those interested in partnering with ABC or learning about their advocacy efforts, please visit abcardio.org to become a member or sign up for our newsletter. Thank you all and have a very good night.